This, uh, this past week, I uh, went to the doctor for my first appointment of, of the new year, and I know that's really exciting news for everybody. You're, you're welcome for that. But it was just basically a checkup to, to see how things were, were going this year. I had, had blood work done to see like those invisible markers that you want to make sure are in the right place. And, and, um, and, but the, the thing that caused me to really, to really make this call and make this appointment is that I'm having pretty bad heartburn lately, and, and I won't get into the specifics there. So that's like showing age as you talk about your health problems. And so you're welcome for that too. But um, when, truth be told, I didn't really want to go to the doctor. I, in fact, I had kind of been putting it off. Um, and if it wasn't for this, this heartburn issue, I probably wouldn't have gone ahead and made the appointment because uh, for the past year or so, I've, um, uh, I've been making some really big progress in, in health wise. And I've lost uh, like about 25 pounds. And, and, and this was all really great until the holiday they set in, and um, that that kind of like stalled out, and 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 so I I was I was thinking, you know, I I really need to to make a bigger impression on my doctor when I go back. So I need to lose more weight before I get there, because I wanted that that attaboy from my doctor, the, the, them to say, you know, good job, you really you really are, are rocking it. Um, and so if it wasn't for that uh, if it wasn't for that that heartburn thing, I probably wouldn't have, have made that uh, appointment because I wanted to be in a better place. Have you ever? done this, you know, start flossing your teeth the week before you go to the dentist. Oh, your teeth look so great. You must floss every day. Yes, every day leading up to this appointment. Or, or you know, you start eating really well for uh, that, that like uh, 72 hours before your blood work panels, and you're like, oh, all right, this is gonna, this is gonna change, you know, six months of, of, of cookies and whatever. Yeah, but, but like, these are the kind of things that are, that are silly that sometimes we do. I, I, swallowed, uh, I swallowed my pride, though, and I, and I made the appointment. And in the middle of, of this, though, it was really kind of difficult for me to appreciate but the reality is, going to the doctor, getting these, these tests run, don't do anything to change your health. That they do nothing to change your health. And, you know, I'm the same health-wise I was today as, as it, whether or not I have the tests run or, or, or not. It just gives you a look at the reality of, of where you are. And the same thing is true with our finances. I know, know some people, and sometimes it really stresses me out to kind of like look and see where, where our financial things are, where credit card statements are, where, where um, medical bills are. I was like, some reason it doesn't really cost what it costs to go to the doctor until I open the bill. And so if I keep it on the counter, it, it's free. It, if I keep it on the counter for longer, it's free. Um, that's not really a good practice, just so you know. Uh, but but it, it doesn't really change when you have an idea and when you actually take a look at your finances or you go to the doctor, it doesn't really change the underlying reality of what is. It just kind of gives you the information that, that of what that reality looks like. Now, I know um, for some of you that are science-minded, and I know just enough about this to really, to, to really get it wrong, but, but I am told that there are certain things that you can observe, and because you observe them, it changes the outcome. So there's that thing that is probably, or that I'm told is true, um, but for the most things in life, whether it's your physical health, or whether it's your finances, or whether it's your spiritual health, taking a look at what's underneath the hood, taking a look at, at, at really where reality is, doesn't do anything to change. doesn't do anything to change what is going on. It just gives you a look at where you are and perhaps where you need to be. And, and uh, here today, if you're here today, I think that there's a, a pretty good chance that, that you are interested in your spiritual growth, in your spiritual health. And so today, we're going to, to be starting a, a time to look at our spiritual, our spiritual lives and our spiritual health. And so regardless of where you are in your spiritual life, regardless of where you are in your faith, I think there's probably a good chance that if you are here today, you are probably somewhere. Maybe you're here today and you're kind of exploring Christ. You, you believe in God, but you're not sure about Jesus. Or, or maybe you're here today and you're, you're growing in Christ. You, you know, you're like, I believe in God and, and, and Jesus, and, and I'm trying to get closer to Him uh, and trying to figure out what that means. Or maybe you consider yourself close to Christ. You know, like, I, I am close to Jesus, and, 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 I, and, and Jesus helps me guide and, and do things in my everyday life. Or maybe you'd say, you know, I'm sold out. 
I'm fully committed to Jesus. I've surrendered my heart. And, and, and your life is patterned after the way of Jesus. Or maybe you're like, preacher, whatever. I don't know where I am, and I don't even know what that means. I'm just here. So regardless of, of where you are today, what I want you to know is over the next few weeks, we are entering into a time of the year where we're going to be focusing on spiritual, spiritual health and what that means. And in church, we call this a season, and we call it a season, the season of Lent. And now maybe you have heard about that before, or heard that, that phrase before at, at a church, or, or like in your dryer as you pull the Lent out of your dryer, whatever the case may be. But the Lent that we're talking about as it relates to church has very little to do, or actually nothing to do with dryer Lent. Um, but it has to do, it goes back to an Anglo-Saxon word um, that, that just means the spring. It's like the lengthening of the days of spring spring. And so it's a spring season. And in the church, it's not just a season leading into spring. It's also a season of preparation, of helping followers of Jesus get reconnected to spiritual growth, of helping followers of Jesus to, to evaluate where you are, to, to re repent and to, to ask forgiveness for the ways that you have perhaps wronged others and wronged yourself, and then to seek to live in new practices that help you get closer to and, and, and be more connected to God. And that's, what, and that's what we're going to be focusing on over these next few weeks, a time of, of helping you prepare and to be, to be closer to Jesus. And so today is the first Sunday of Lent, and, and for the next several weeks, we're going to devote some seriousness to some spiritual practices that can help you grow closer to Jesus in your spiritual health. And this is important because just like going to the doctor for your physical health, sometimes you need to kind of look at your own spiritual health. And I don't care how mature your spiritual health is or how immature your spiritual health is, there are times that you struggle. We all struggle at times where there are always going to be times in your life that you feel far from God or times that you struggle with, with certain temptations or times that, that you are less kind or uh, less patient than perhaps you feel that you should be. And it's at these times it's really important to try to figure out where we are and where you are. Even the earliest Christians, those that knew Jesus one-to-one, -one, they even struggled with this. In fact, Jesus um, once said, and, and, and this guy named John recorded these words, Jesus once was writing and speaking words to the church in the city called Ephesus. And uh, John records this message in Revelation chapter 2. And here's what Jesus says, I have this against you. So something's messed up. Jesus is telling this church, I have this against you. You have let go of the love you had at first. So remember the high point from which you have fallen. Change your hearts and your lives and do the things you did at first. So Jesus is just saying, you know, you once had this great love, you had this great vigor in your faith, but you have lost it. Something is not right, and I want you to return from this. So even the earliest Christians, those that some of those that knew Jesus one-to-one -one, or their parents knew Jesus one-to-one, -one, they, they even needed a spiritual health checkup and reminder of how to continue to grow closer to Jesus. So that's what we're going to focus on over the next several weeks. We're going to explore practices that are central to growing in faith. And today, our first practice that we're going to talk about is worship. Now, right now, we're in the middle of worship service, and, and, and uh, if, if you're here in person this morning, you're like, well, I'm already here. I've got the worship thing. Like, I got out of bed this morning. I, I, I got dressed. I drank my coffee, and I got here. And it's some for, you, for some of you, that's a miracle uh, because it's, it's hard, whether it's because of health reasons or whether it's because of kid reasons. Like, it's just hard to get anywhere sometimes. It's hard in my life to get anywhere sometimes. So you're like, I, I've got this. Um, and so today what I want to do is invite you to think about worship. And we're going to talk about what worship really is. What worship really is. This idea, this English word that we have, um, that we have that this is worship, it's got its roots in an old English word that, that is, uh, uh, that's got a different spelling. It's worth-ship, like how much something is worth. And so this idea, of, this idea that we have of worship comes from this word of speaking about worth, worth-ship. And what it meant in the, the original context was that you're honoring, giving honor and glory to someone who is worthy of honor and glory. 
So when you worship God, you acknowledge God's glory, you acknowledge God's power and and goodness and recognize and honor God as God. And here's the other thing, when you recognize and honor God as God, you're also recognizing that you are not. That, that you are not God. Even though sometimes we think we are or we think we're the most important person in the room or whatever the case may be, when you worship, you recognize that God is God and that you are not. And so that is what it means to, to basically, in the essence, that's what it means to worship. And how you do that, though, is, is really important. How you worship God is really important. So what I want to share with you is just a look. The next thing I want to share with you is just a look at how some of the ancient people really worship God. And I want to share with you a really old part of the Bible. It comes from the book of Psalms. And Psalms were, it's kind of like the original song book for people of faith. And, and the people in ancient Israel, the, these were people that, that God had, had chosen uh, to, to carry God's message into the world, they wrote these psalms as a way to express faith to God. And, and so what I want to share with you, some of these worship leaders that's writing these songs, I want to share with you a psalm today, Psalm 95, where I think it really gets to the heart of what worship was and what worship can be. Here we read these words. Come, let's sing out loud to the Lord. Let's raise a joyful shout to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before Him with thanks. Let's shout songs of joy to Him. The Lord is a great God, the great King over all other gods. The earth's depths are in His hands. The mountain heights belong to Him. The sea which He made is is His, along with the dry land which His own hands formed. Come, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord, our Maker. He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hands. Here you have an invitation to worship to come, to sing out loud to the Lord, to sing songs and praise for the goodness of God, to recognize God as creator, and to realize your place as part of that creation. And then there's this posture of prayer that's talked about in this this psalm, this idea of kneeling down, of being bowed down before God, of kneeling before God. And when I think about worship, this is, is so, so important. This psalm shows that that worship is about God and not about you. That worship is about God and not about you. Often we get this idea that worship is about our preferences. That worship is about the things that that we like. You know, I really like this song, or or I really like this this thing that we do in worship. I mean, even here at Kern Church, we have two different worship services that have two different styles, and, and, and you could probably dig into some of that and say, you know, some of us have a preference for a certain style of worship. Some of us have a preference for a, for a different style of worship. But, but there's, some, you know, there's some nuances to this. But in reality, worship is, is not primarily about you. And, and this is kind of, I think, difficult to, to really, I mean, it's easy to say, but it's kind of difficult to live because we live in a world where everything is about us, where every message that we have that you and I receive is given to us, designed for us. We live in a world of entertainment where performances are done in a way that, that, are, that are for you. You have ads that are created for you. You have so many different things in your life created for, for you to, to, to enjoy or for you to consume. And worship, a lot of worship seems like entertainment because we have people like in this service, we have people on, on a stage that are leading in song, have me up front talking to you. And whether that's entertaining or not, I don't know. But like, you know, it's, it's just, it, it, it's, it's this, oh, I got a thumbs up in the back. Y'all are like, do you, I'm not, I'm not like paying you extra for that. I, um, anyways, but um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's not, it, you know, we have, we, so there's a lot of similarities, I think, from what we do in worship to the world of performance and the world of theater. But when it comes to worship, worship is not theater. And the main reason I think this is true is because when it comes to worship, there's an audience of one. There's an audience of one. It doesn't matter how large or how small your church is. There should only ever be an audience of one. And God is the audience of worship. 
It doesn't matter how large or how small the church is, how many people are in attendance or how many people aren't in attendance. God alone is the one who is the proper audience of worship. Now, sometimes we get this backwards and we start to think that worship is about what makes you feel good or, or might, make you, might seem right to you. Sometimes we get this idea that, that, um, that, 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 that we, that you are the audience, that we are trying to entertain or trying to help something happen there, that, that that's primarily what our purpose is. But when we look at what worship is in the Scriptures, it's all about helping people connect to God and helping people worship God. God who alone is the audience. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes this is a struggle for me because I have songs I like to sing, I have things that I like to see and worship. Sometimes I'm sure this is a struggle for musicians because usually in, 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 in music that we are playing music to be entertained to, to, to a larger audience and to try to entertain people, but it all is about blessing God and helping you, other people, Bless God as well. So what does that make you? What does that make you? If you are not the audience of worship, if God alone is the audience of worship, what does that make you? And, and like churches do, we have a really great church word for this, and it's you are not the audience, you are the congregation. And I can't really think of a, another way that we really, another place in which we really talk about a group of people as a congregation as we do in the church. Now I'm sure there are places that, and there are different areas that we do this, But you are people who are gathered here, who are congregating here to worship God. And so by being in a congregation, your your role is not primarily to enjoy worship and to be entertained. Your role is to participate in worship. Your role is to join in the call of Psalm 95, to, to bow down and sing out loud to God. And the role of the people up front is to help you do this, to help you connect to, to help you to worship a God who loves you. And so that brings us to the next question is how, how do you worship God? How do we worship God? And truth be told, our modern worship practices have evolved from generation to generation. What we do today, people, uh, some people assume that, that what we do today is what has always been done. And people, people will often say, you know, I really like traditional worship and whatever that means because the traditional worship models that we, we have today um, are, are very different than they were in the time of Jesus. The ways that you and I worship today are very different than, than the ways that people worshiped many, many years ago. But... There are some core ideas I think that the early people of faith had when it came to worship that still influence how you and I engage in this today. For, for example, we can look at the practice of when we worship. This is an important thing of, of when you and I are supposed to worship. And you might know this, but people of the Jewish faith, they worship on Saturdays. And Jesus was Jewish, and so, so the, 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 the followers of Jesus come from, from um, have this straight, this long lineage from Jesus who was Jewish to, the, to the, 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 the God's people in relationship with the ancient Israelites who worshiped on a Saturday. And, and the reason that, that the Jewish people worship on a Saturday is that is, is many reasons, but one of the main reasons goes from the very earliest parts in the Bible, from Genesis chapter 1, where, where we hear the story of how God created everything in six days, and then on the seventh day, God rested and, and set apart one day out of seven to be a day of rest and to be a day of worship. And so a whole community of people built worship practices around what it meant and the rhythms to take one one day out of seven to rest. And, and so this day, the day of rest, is known as the Sabbath. And, and, and for the Jewish people, this is Saturday. There are even some Christian communities who worship on Saturday because they feel that that, that day has, has never really been changed in Scripture. But here's the thing when it comes to Christians. Most Christians, even though there are some that worship on Saturday, most Christians worship on Sunday. And I always kind of wondered why this was, and I remember asking questions about this. Well, why, if Jesus would have worshipped on a Saturday, and if Jewish people would have worshipped on a Saturday, why do Christians mainly worship on the Sunday? And the reason is, is because Christians saw Sunday as the Lord's Day. And it goes to the earliest stories of Easter, of when Jesus was raised from the grave on Easter, which was the first day of the week. And so the earliest Christians started worshipping the first day of the week as the day to celebrate the Lord. 
Lord. It's the day to celebrate the good things that have happened through Christ Jesus and his resurrection. And even to this day, this informs how followers of Jesus view Sunday and the things that we are invited to do to worship today. So in writing about, about worship, an, another, another pastor um, identified some, some things that, that the earliest Christians did when they met together on that Lord's Day. And, and I want to share these with you today because I think that they can help inform how we think about the role of worship in our lives. So, so the first thing that, that this pastor shared is that the earliest Christians prayed with and for one another, giving thanks to God. So it was a prayer with one another and for one another. They sang psalms and hymns and spiritual songs together to God. They, they broke bread together, sharing the Lord's Supper as a way of communion with Christ and with one another. They confessed their sins to God and, and one another. They reflected upon Scripture and the stories of Jesus that they might be more faithful followers of Jesus. They sought to encourage one another, spurring one another to a life of love and good deeds. And they collected an offering, expressing love and gratitude to God while seeking to help others. And when, when, when myself and other leaders of our church get together to plan worship, we still work to do these same things. We still work to, to do these same things, to help you connect to God and worship God in a similar way that the earliest Christians did. It looks different than it did back then, but these practices are still at the core of what it means and how to, to live into a life of Christian worship and how, and how we want you to be able to worship God. So what does that mean for you? Well, we're talking about spiritual growth during this season. That's kind of a season of spiritual growth. And our, our hope, my hope, is that this can help you grow closer to Jesus. And in reality, the reality is that people who, who are trying to follow Jesus, who are trying to grow closer to God, that, that one of the practices that is essential in this is worship. Worship is, a, is, a central, is central to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So it's not all that important that I, that I share with you some things about worship that you might not have known before or, or that, you, um, that, that is helpful to you or not helpful to you. That's not all that important. What's important is, is that you are able to worship because worshiping is, is what helps you, is one of the things that helps you to be a person growing in their faith. And I think that there are two basic reasons for why worship helps you grow in your faith. And the first reason is, is one I already kind of talked about, but it's that worship is about God. Worship is about God. So what this does, worship does, is it puts you in a place where you're not first where it's not about you, but it's about God. It's about surrendering your own desires, your own sinfulness, your own mistakes, your own habits, your own hurts, your own hang-ups. It's about surrendering your own self to God who is bigger than you, but yet to a God who cares and loves for you. So worship is about putting yourself in a place before God. And the second reason that I think worship is important is that we do is because we do it together. We do it together. One time Jesus was talking to some of his followers and he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. When there's two or three people who are gathered in my name, I am there with them. Something special happens when you gather with others, when you gather with others for worship. It's, it's no longer about you. It's no longer about just you and God. It's about you all. It's about all of y'all. It's about us together. It's about me and you together, joining together and deepening our relationship with God and in deepening our relationships with one another. And when you do this, you can find encouragement for the spiritual journey that is ahead. And so as we begin Lent, this is an intentional focus on spiritual growth. I want to invite you to take, take a next step, to take a next step when it comes to worship. And the first next step that I will share with you may be a bit of a challenge because it has to do with how often you join in worship at church. It used to be that, that people who were committed Christians attended worship at least three to four times a month. That means that if, if somebody was a follower of Jesus, is committed, that, that they, would, they would pattern their, their lives in being in church three to four Sundays a month. We know, though, that this just isn't the case anymore. That, that, that uh, data about people around the nation 
people don't attend worship as much as they used to. And we're not even talking about people who aren't Christians. We're just talking about people who would say that they're committed Christians, that, that people don't attend church as much as they used to. I mean, if you're here in this space today, you can look around and see that, right? Like, they're, they're, if everybody that attended worship at this service was here, all of these seats would be filled. I mean, these are people that are committed and that are regular, and um, if, you're, if you're usually here at 9 o'clock and you're not here right now, don't hear this as me, like, calling you out. Um, but ju- it's just the reality of where we are. Because today, people that consider themselves committed followers of Jesus, they may attend worship only like once a month and still consider themselves, still consider themselves as someone who's deeply committed to Jesus. Now, maybe this resonates with you and you see this in your own life and some of your own patterns. And, um, and the reality is, and the reality is, there's a lot that, that, that I won't get into. The reality is, though, that, that I kind of understand this um, because I'm busy, too, and I have kids, too, and, and we have family to visit, too, and we have other kinds of things that are involved, and sometimes we're just, like, really tired, too. And, and so, you know, I, I, there's a lot about this I understand, but there's also, and just being honest with you, a lot about this I don't really understand because of my position as a pastor, because I know that, that I have to be here. One, that's like an obligation. But two, like I know that I have to be here because my heart starts to, starts to like be more self-centered and, and be more like uh, isolated if I'm not. If I'm not in worship on a regular basis, I know that, that things start, start devolving in my own heart, in my own life. So I, so I have a hard time kind of understanding and relating to this. And I know that, that uh, some might say, well, what about online? And we've got some people that are, that are joining us online this morning. And what I want you to know is that online can be good. It really can be good. It's a way for people to connect who have limited mobility. It's a way for people to connect who are, who are seeking a, a church. It's a way for people to connect when they're sick or when they're traveling. But there is something important. There is something important about being together with other people in worship that cannot be replaced in the digital world, that cannot be replaced by listening to a podcast, that cannot be replaced by watching a recording of worship. So if you're trying to grow in your faith, the question then comes, how often should you worship? How often should you be in worship? And I think that the biblical pattern for how often you should be in worship, it points to the fact that it is every week. That it is every weekend. We see this in the, in the whole order of creation of how God created one day out of seven to be a day of rest, to be a day of, of concerning about the spiritual things, to be a day about worshiping God with others. And I'll also know that this is not always possible. There are times when I travel. There are times when I get sick. And so I, I know and I get it that it is not possible to be in this place every single week But I think that that's what the biblical model points to. So here's my challenge for you in this new season of Lent. And as I am saying this, I think it's a little bit silly, okay? But my challenge for you between now and Easter is I want to challenge you to to get an A in worship, okay? Like an A. So like when you, when you go to school and, and you, you have grades, uh, you get like 90% and above is an A, right? And, and, and so a B is like 80 to 90%. Um, that used to be like a different scale when I was in school. But anyways, so, so like 90% to 100% is, is an A. And, and, and so my encouragement to you is to, uh, to achieve a, an A in your worship attendance. I told you it was a little silly. Like I even kind of feel weird saying this. But my, my encouragement for you is to, to achieve an A in, in worship, 90% in worship attendance between now and Easter. Worshiping online can, can still count if that's, if that's needed in your life. And if you're traveling for, for spring break like I am, worshiping online or, or worshiping at a different church, uh, wherever you are, that definitely counts as well. So, 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 give that, so give that to yourself. But here's the breakdown. On a yearly basis... On a yearly basis, to get a 90% in attendance, that means missing no, no more than five Sundays a week in worship. So five Sundays a week. Oh yeah, thank you. A year, right, a week. There's a lot of Sundays in a week. 
but a, a year. So that means missing no more than five Sundays a, 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 a week, a year, a year. But here's the other way of looking at it. That's a month. You can slop around for a whole month and still get an A. Um, I, I tell my kids that when they're worried about tests. I was like, you hear your grades, you can like flunk this thing and still get a good grade in this class, so don't worry about this one test too much. So, so like, the reality is that, that, that to get an A in worship, it just means that, that, that being present in worship when you are available and missing no fewer than five uh, on uh, weeks during a year. And, and I, I know this sounds a little silly. I know that sounds a, a little strange, perhaps. But my encouragement for you is, is to focus on that during the, month, during the season of Lent. To really focus on trying to be present in worship. Not for me or for, for any type of thing like that, but for yourself. So that you can connect better to God and you can connect better to other people. And if you're joining us online, and I really want to encourage you, if you can, to, to join us in person and to to be with other people in person if you can. So the first step in your spiritual growth, the first next step, is to encourage you to get an A in worship. And the next thing that I want to share with you, the next step, recognizes that there is more to worship than just worshiping on Sundays. In fact, prayer is a daily practice, a daily spiritual practice that involves your own individual worship of God. If you were with us a couple of weeks ago, we focused on, on, on prayer. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time today talking about prayer. I'll send out an email this week linking to that sermon if anybody's interested and, and missed it. Um, but I just want to encourage you today also to take a step in prayer. And one way that you can do that is, is by praying our breakthrough prayer. Here at Kern Church, we believe in the power of, of God to move through prayer. And we have this thing called a breakthrough prayer. And so if you're new here, you might not know about the breakthrough prayer, but it's listed in your worship program. I don't know where the sermon is. It says breakthrough prayer. And, and, and this is a prayer that, that we join together to pray for God to do new things in our lives, in our church, in our communities. And many of us have alarms on our phones that go off at 1101, reminding us to pray this prayer each and every day. So my encouragement for you is to, um, is to pray this prayer on a daily basis. It's to pray this prayer or another one every single day and to set an alarm or reminder for yourself to pray, to worship with God. And so if you want to know more about our breakthrough prayer, you can find that in the worship program. You can also find more information at kernchurch.org slash pray. So in addition to getting an A in worship, my challenge for you is, is during this season of Lent is to set reminders to pray, to pray daily, to help you connect to God in your own personal worship. So if you're ready to, work, to, to, to focus, if you're ready to focus on growing in your faith during this season of Lent, I want to invite you, I want to invite you to worship. Are you ready to put God first? Are you ready to worship God? And are we ready to grow and to take a step in growing in your faith over these next several weeks? So right now, I want to say a word of prayer encouraging you. And then we're going to sing a, a worship song together. And as we sing that song together, please know that you're invited. If you want to come forward and pray at the kneeling rail, you're invited to do so. You're invited to pray right where you are, just asking God to help you grow in your faith. Asking God to, to, see, to see how you can take those next steps to Christ. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I, I, I thank you for, for not allowing everything to be a mystery. I thank you that when things get difficult and, and things seem a little strange, that, that sometimes you can give us just some simple steps that, that we can take to come back to you. And so this day I ask that you help, help each one who is here to worship you to worship you as we conclude this worship service and sing this final song, but also to make a point and a commitment to worship you, to worship you throughout this season of Lent, so that we can and they can see, see you moving in their hearts and their lives. Help us also just to connect with you each and every day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.